For now, we are going to go to Super Tuesday, a Super Duper Tuesday with Edinger Mantum. Hello. What's good? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I got you. All right. Perfect. He's calling from an undisclosed location. Lock the in we yeah. need to talk about super duper tuesday very big i'm in the elections bunker i'm in the like the election war room the situation yeah. room so much has happened so much chaos so much controversy and such unpredictable events unfolded yesterday i'm of course being sarcastic for those in the chat yeah, who don't yeah. understand it was probably the most mid the most boring Super Tuesday, at least in my lifetime. Several lifetimes and several generations. I think I've probably brought this up before. The last election that where the nominations were decided this early on was 1828. <laughs> it's been nearly 200 years. I'm glad that we're going back in time. That to me spells stability. That's what that yeah. says to me. It seems like you hate yeah. stability. It's Speaking of stability, let's start off yeah. with the real winner of last night. Jason Palmer yeah. of American Samoa. Yes, ceasefire candidate. He's the guy. He's going to clutch this. We won. We Palmer won. heads rise up is what i say yeah he's the guy for those of you who don't know jason palmer ran on a campaign of being famous in the mainland yeah and it worked and now he is and he secured i think 51 votes or something i don't know i think yeah. i think they have a caucus structure in american they samoa. have a caucus in, in american samoa where like 12 people vote every year they always like vote for like the most bull candidates like in 2020 like it famously the race between michael bloomberg and tulsi gabbard which was an upset because Tulsi was expected to win there because she was actually born in American Samoa. But Big Mike went in there. He uh, paid for everybody's votes. He did like machine boss stuff and he uh, won that. And it was his one primary that he won. Yeah. As you guys know, Michael Bloomberg did go on to become president. So yeah, American did, Samoa, yeah. a lot of upsides to winning American Samoa. Can't see any yeah. downsides. It was a very predictable Super Tuesday overall. Trump won pretty much every state with the exception of Vermont. Big wins yeah. for Nikki Slaley there. Yeah, uh, her, Nikki she Slaley. Beat, she um, she came just behind Alf Landon in 1936. Um, she's got this 2028. She's going two states now. Eventually, she's going to win all 50 by like 2060. Yeah. If you vote for her, she will win. Um, yeah. Which, of course, was also predictable. And Nikki Slaley uh, has now come out and says is going to be suspending her campaign. Not sure if she already publicly came out and suspended it, but I think NPR scooped She did, yeah. Okay. I missed that part because I've been too busy talking about the sweatiest, nerdiest gamers of all time getting mad at black women representation in video games or some. So Nikki Slaley, despite the fact that we need you Nikki right now, is an absolute unimaginable banger, undisputed banger. She still yeah. ended up suspending her campaign for president. Yeah, um, really like the most baffling campaign I've seen in a while. I have no clue what her plan was. I was really high on her before the actual voting started. I thought like she was kind of like making real moves. She was setting herself up. She was walking the tightrope like she was going to be the guy in 2028. But no, she just like she got tilted and she got pissed off. And now she's like a persona non grata forever. Um, I mean, it made sense. I think that like she was like an old school Republican. I think she wanted to preserve the party, saw the writing on the wall and recognize that like the Trumpism from within or not even Trumpism, but like just increasingly more conspiratorial thinking and whatnot can easily secure the most reactionary base of support from the Republican Party is going to create volatility for the Republican Party, which is a ever present danger for the future prospects of the Republican Party, despite the fact that the Democratic Party does everything they can to ensure that the republicans can still win elections mm -hmm. yeah um, she's basically right about like politics in general her, her brand is very strong like people like in a general election if she ever became the candidate against biden she would win very easily but um republicans don't want to hear it they're like shut up you're annoying yeah Stop and a woman Stop you fucking with the vibe Leave and, us alone. and according to some uh, that were interviewed by nbc uh she has no balls to scratch and that mm -hmm. she should get back to the kitchen uh which was a direct quote from uh, a north carolina primary voter and also uh, a north carolina primary diner goer said that she uh, has menopause yeah so yeah that's just kind of what you have to deal with in the party i hope she, she probably i think she had a fun time so mm -hmm. i do think that like there there is a level genuine interest i can't believe i'm saying this from nikki haley like i do think that she genuinely was like we have to change the narrative as best as we possibly can but uh, i think it was an overall failure like i i don't even no. think it was like as big as a careerist opportunity for her to like no, she stay in the race career. like totally i like do not know what she was doing the past couple months like she was kind of like making a lane as like the hawkish kind of traditional Republican who still supported Trump and accepted where the party was going. And she was still liked within the party. She was one of the few people who like national politicians with a positive approval rating. And then she just totally went like anti-Trump, like John Kasich, like style coming out against him in a way that like makes her like the enemy in their eyes. So like 
it's just weird to see her like actually kind of like play the game for a full year and then just totally lose her mind at the end of it. It's not that she was wrong or anything or that like she wasn't justified in getting pissed off when he insulted her husband. Like, I mean, come on. Like, I thought you kind of knew what you were getting into. Absolutely. Um, There was a last ditch effort from the Koch brothers or Koch brother mm. and some of the other party like institutionalists in the Republican Party to move away from Rhino Ron DeSantis to Nikki Haley. But obviously that didn't lead to any promising results results because the Republican Party is totally captured by Donald Trump. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah. He is a Republican through and through in his output. His legislative agenda is also very Republican, obviously. His output is uh, is is very captivating to Republican voters in general. Yeah, they like, like He's the guy who won. He's the only guy a lot of them, like I remember winning in the past 20 years, like they are for, you know, like, the party establishment is forever marked by losing to Obama twice. While in their minds, Trump won twice and is going to win a third time. So like, what's the the point of ever breaking from him so nikki slaley is out unfortunately and mm -hmm. uh some other some other uh, things i wanted to talk about like the democrats wanting to lose was actually an interesting move played by adam shit in california yeah, he went off he popped his uh shussy so what ended up happening in, in the California primaries is that Adam Schiff was up against Katie Porter and Barbara Lee specifically as mm -hmm. uh, as contenders for the uh, Democratic Party to, to fill the seat of Dianne Feinstein that was evacuated when uh, Dianne Feinstein went to heaven um, yeah. and is, is serving cunt up there alongside mm -hmm. Ruth Bader Ginsburg and yeah, maybe soon Nancy Pelosi. So Adam Schiff uh, is most like, I mean, obviously he's going to win because it's oh, California. Yeah, he's a lock now. Yeah, it sucks. It's yeah. California is going to have one of the most mid Senate delegations in the country, right? Like for a blue state, because you have Alex Padilla, who's like actually pretty good, but he's like very low profile, and Adam Shit, who's just like a blue dog, like he's like a straight up conservative, yeah. like big OPEC guy. Yeah, and basically what Adam Schiff ended up doing is fill the exact same role of Dianne Feinstein in a deep blue state that should have significantly more progressive senators. Yeah, and I think Georgia becomes... has solid, has a more left wing Senate, Senate delegation than California. Yeah. Yeah, but that is always the case, I feel like, now, especially nowadays, where, like, the Repo the Democratic Party utilizes California and New York as, like, as... as Piggy banks. Ed, yeah, as headquarters for some of the worst candidates you can get. Yeah, the worst um, politicians imaginable. imaginable yeah. It's insane. They haven't had a good politician out of California since, like, I don't know how long. Since like, Ronald I see Reagan, brother. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. The course, last yeah. time. Last time California had some real Americans, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. It's a stronghold for establishment Democrats. They do use it like a piggy bank. God forbid they had someone actually a little bit more progressive. Katie Porter herself literally was terrified of, of APAC funding, genuinely maneuvered in a way to, to try to avoid saying, you know, uh, avoid being pro ceasefire. Barbara Lee, of course, was yeah. uh, was pro ceasefire. The only... Yeah, uh, she was one of the, probably one of the best people in Congress, but just the way she ran that, it was a very sad end to a a very like long and storied career where she did a lot of brave things like famously i think she was one of the only members she was the only member of congress to vote against the invasion of, Af of afghanistan in either yep. chamber uh so like i was actually very excited when she started running i was like oh this she's pretty old but like this is she, this could be pretty cool to like have someone like her kind of cap her career off this way but it never got off the ground she had huge issues with funding and by the end she she thought um newsom would um gruesome newsom would appoint her to the senate after feinstein died but it didn't happen and she was kind of doa after that so she came up with like some like funny policies like trying to shift the conversation i think at one point she endorsed a 50 dollar minimum wage yeah that was a, a flop she got like seven percent it was sad yeah so barbara lee and and uh catherine moore had to also remove themselves from their from their house seats right yeah yeah all three of them had, had to retire from their seats to run in this race yeah there's another interesting part of this story as well they like basically gave up their seats so they could run for this and then adam schiff came in and spent like 10 million dollars promoting the republican yeah so that it wasn't didn't a it wasn't a contested in the general it wouldn't be between him and like an objectively more progressive democrat yeah that's the jungle primary system there it's very like kind of bizarre but that's exactly what he did he had he had he's a republic his republican opponent or there were several republican opponents who were just not getting off the ground the party there just was not putting any effort but he picked one guy steve garvey who was um, a first baseman for the dodgers like 40 years ago and he started advertising quote unquote against him 
but it ended up just raising his profile with Republican voters yes. so he would get ahead of Porter, which in the end, it was not actually all that close. Porter came very, very far from, I mean, we'll see only half the votes are counted. We'll see what it looks like later on. But uh, she only yeah, has like 14 eight months right now. Yeah, she's like 18 <laughs> points behind. It wasn't even like a contest. But uh, yeah, he like really, it was very Machiavellian from his part. Yeah, so, very but now Machiavellian. But also simultaneously kind of dumb because now you've like activated more Republicans in California that will pad yeah. the numbers of the popular vote in favor of the Republicans because California has more Republicans overall than many Republican states. Yeah. And there also and, are tons of swing house seats in the state. That's, yeah. California is crucial for them taking back control of the House. Yeah. There are tons and tons. Yeah. If you had only two Democrats in the ballot, like Republicans still would have come out to vote for Trump probably, but there wouldn't have been like another race for them to pay attention to there would have been that much less advertising for republicans in the state exactly yeah so um like they're gonna really with the new york um with like the new york democrats capitulating on redistricting and the wisconsin seats not being redrawn they lost like up to eight seats they could have otherwise locked down their chances of getting the house i think have gone down a lot like since that happened like on the same day and they're going to need to take out these republicans in southern california who represent these kind of like moderately blue districts and with uh, garvey potentially like i mean he hasn't campaigned much but with him on the ballot it'll just add that much more incentive for republicans in the state to vote even and, even uh, never trump republicans which california has plenty of as well that will now be like well this guy seems more moderate because like yeah, of regardless course. of what Especially Adam Schiff says County, in the exact seats where they need to win that'll be exactly what happens yep which is once again Democrats maneuvering or, or moving in a way that harms them in the long run absolutely destroys or, or makes their chances of like uh, yeah like you said winning winning the house all that less likely by spending tens of millions of dollars specifically promoting a guy who literally did not campaign himself Steve Steve Garvey yeah. did not campaign. He He's did not chilling. campaign. And Schiff's campaign spent driving. more than $12 million on ads, contrasting him with Garvey, which increased his profile. Yeah. It's like the shitty version of when they like promote the really far right Republicans in competitive House seats, which actually does work and is pretty smart. But this only was for the benefit of one guy who's like a really terrible politician. Well, He's an impeachment it, merchant. It works until Donald Trump. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was he's an impeachment merchant. He's a fraud. He's a blue dog. Like it's it's pretty lame. I don't think he'll be like a like a mansion type, but it's certainly not like the best you would want because he's gonna have that seat for like thirty years now. Dude, Garvey has no chance. No, we're not talking about Garvey winning. We already said that Adam Schiff is a lock in California, where like yeah. only a quarter of the electorate is is. We're saying that Adam Schiff is locked in one hundred percent. But he's, he's going won. to create more down ballot voters that are Republican that will go out to vote. for for him that will then vote for Republicans in other districts. Yeah, just to get get a sense of how close these races can be, there was one race in 2020 in Southern California that was a, a seat in Los Angeles County, uh, the California's 25th district. It was decided by 300 votes. Like the margins for these seats are extremely small. Like really anything can tip the balance. And for the past two Congresses, we've had majorities in the like like five seats large. They really cannot like afford to um, drop any of these seats because they've already done poorly in them for the past two cycles. So that wasn't great for, yeah. for uh, California's future. One thing that I did want to talk about that I don't hear a lot of noise from mainstream media, at least up until, uh, I mean, certainly a lot more noise was heard uh, in the Michigan primaries, but not a lot, yeah. not as much now. The uncommitted vote. Yeah, that's what I, um, I've thought about that a lot since last night. It's, it's very kind of weird. There, there, there's a lot of stuff that like I, di I didn't expect in both directions, but yeah, um, there were some states that were better than others. Just um, I could just kind of do a lightning round of some areas if you'd like. Like across the board, besides Minnesota, which is the huge exception, these results were not good for Biden. He didn't crack 90 percent in any states. Um, I, no, he did in Tennessee and Alabama, but he um, he cracked under 90 percent in most states, uh, which is not good for him. That's like underrunning what Obama did. But geographically, it wasn't super clear. He did better in uh, New England than I thought he would be. I kind of expected that to be a more kind of non-committed area but he was like he did pretty well like in vermont maine massachusetts like it wasn't terrible he did better than, than in michigan and all those states i was surprised by how poorly he did in the south because in south carolina he got 95 percent of the vote and i sort of expected that to be the case in 
Alabama, Arkansas, or even Virginia. But in Virginia and North Carolina, there were actually like pretty significant like numbers of people voting uncommitted. In North Carolina, it got 13%. In Virginia, which I would have thought would have been a very strong state for Biden because it's one of the states that's like Raytheon Acres, like very uh, kind of centrist, like a lot of like Romney Biden voters. Biden got under like 90% of the vote and Marianne Williamson hit 8%, which was like fine to me. Like they were just rocking with her heart over there. Texas was, there wasn't really much of a sign for, of like an anti-war vote in Texas, but he did terribly on the border. It validates a lot of the poor numbers with Hispanics, but uh, we've been seeing Latinos for Trump are real. The West Coast and mountain states haven't finished counting yet, but he did do a bit better in Colorado than I thought. But the big story that really shocked me and was like really stood out from everything else was Minnesota. Yep. That was huge, completely like like head and shoulders above everything else. Numbers I would not have expected. Biden nearly went under 70 percent there. That it's insane. Like, I can't think of any precedent for this. And it was clearly about Gaza. Like you could see like um, the precincts. The, w- there was a direct correlation between how young a precinct was, how many young voters it had and how uncommitted it was. So in a lot of states where things weren't very clear for whatever reasons, there wasn't a clear geographic pattern. The number of uncommitted votes were small. There was a very, very clear constituency here in Minnesota specifically, which is weird. Maybe like the protest vote here is localized entirely to the upper Midwest. Maybe like being around Muslims because there's a lot of uh, Somali immigrants in Minnesota, just like Arab immigrants in uh, Michigan makes voters there more sympathetic towards like Muslims overseas. But it really, really stood out. It was a very bad result for Biden. He looked like this is not numbers an incumbent Bro, should get. Hennepin got 25.5% to Biden's 63.5%. Yeah, Hennepin it County. was under two thirds of the vote in like the most important county in the state for Democrats. It rams. Yeah, that's where Minneapolis is. It's like the Ilhan Omar area. Yeah. I got to say, I kind of, uh, I need to fill out the Ilhan Omar apology form because like this does look like it's kind of her territory that was very strong here more so than any other place we've seen so far uh so like i guess like they put in the work like in the twin cities like they, that really like stood out more than anything else because they, even in michigan there wasn't a clear geographic pattern to where the uncommitted did the best it kind of did the best in urban areas but it wasn't a huge difference here like you can clearly see that uncommitted did the best in the twin cities it was a very very immediately noticeable and uh like they did well enough to win statewide delegates. It's it's nuts. I want to pause here for a brief moment and reiterate something very important in our analysis of these numbers. For those of you who simply do not understand the uncommitted voter percentages and why they are massively important. Actually uncommitted people do not go out and vote in the Democratic primary. These mm-hmm. are Democratic Party loyalists that want to go out and make a statement about the direction that the Biden campaign is heading in. So the numbers might look like it's just 20% and you're like, well, Biden still wins, but that is actually massively consequential for the general election. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is something that you need to understand. These are voters who are basically saying in a very obvious way, they are willing to vote for the Democratic Party and many of them would vote for the Democratic Party and they are voting on the Democratic ticket. Okay, but they're not going to unless Biden changes course on uh, on its... uh, uh, it's it's complete capitulation to Israel in its ethnic cleansing campaign in Gaza. Yeah, I think I um, this is something I tried to really focus on here because people like when the Michigan votes came in, everybody was comparing it to um, the results in 2012 when uncommitted also got around 10 percent. Then the, the environments are completely different. Back then, parties were less polarized. There was a big faction of um, conservative ancestral Democrats who have, whose families have voted Democratic since the Civil War and continued like identifying as Democrats for basically racist reasons and um, like just voted against Obama that year because they thought he was too liberal or because he was black. Those voters are gone now. Like those kinds of voters who could bring random like convicted felons to 40 percent of the vote in like West Virginia, those voters have either died or they just became Republicans. The the you should be expecting an incumbent Democratic president to be doing what every other incumbent Democrat on in incumbent primaries, winning over 95 percent of the vote like he did in South Carolina, because these voters who are voting in these races are incredibly loyal. They are the kinds of voters who like have not moved away from him whatsoever in the polling. The, like the whole like kind of analysis of the election right now is that Biden specifically does well among voters who are very engaged in politics and follow it closely, but is doing very badly compared to 2020 among voters who um, do not follow politics closely and are less likely to vote. There is supposed to be a big gap there. 
And for that reason, I was very skeptical of how well the uncommitted campaign could do, even though I knew that there was a large constituency of people out there who were very upset about Biden's policy and wanted a ceasefire. Those were the types of voters who don't vote in in these kinds of races. Like, I think the comparison that I made in an article I wrote about Michigan is like, it's like the political equivalent of Fort Knox suffering a massive breach to a group of people that had only been organizing for three weeks. Not only is it bad enough by itself, but it projects a terrible sign for Biden's ability to hold on to light, more lightly defended, i.e. less loyal voters. So if that he's is doing the most, this badly, that's the most significant yeah. part. Sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off. Can you yeah. uh, say the last part again? Yeah, it's not only is this bad enough by itself, but it projects a terrible sign for Biden's ability to hold on to the more lightly defended, i.e. less loyal voters. This is what I mean in the subheading when I said this result was just a tip of the iceberg. If the party's most staunch loyalists are this discontented, I can only imagine how poorly Biden is doing with voters who are well and truly alienated. He should have killed it with this electorate. I expected him to kill it, to kill with this electorate, but he didn't. It's not hard to think that his problems over Israel may go even deeper than we thought. And that was after Michigan. The results there were not nearly as bad as they, they were bad, but they're not nearly as bad as what we had in Minnesota last night. One thing you can't compare with the with the Obama second term uh, in the incumbency is that Obama was black far before. Okay. Yeah. Whereas uh, the uncommitted campaign and people had made up their minds about him being black because of white supremacy far yeah. before this. So there was a lot more momentum to go out and like make a statement. Yeah. Whereas the uncommitted voting campaign was put together in a matter of weeks, both in Michigan yeah. and then even a shorter time frame in Minnesota. Yeah, it's incredible. I put out that article like where I listed like the procedures for voting for doing protest votes like this had started so nobody even had a map of like what this was like everybody just ended up using the map that i made because nobody had done it before this was like a completely kind of bolt from the blue thing i can only really imagine what could have happened if they started organizing this a couple months earlier i am a little kind of uh, yeah yeah it's a little rough i mean we have some states going up that like they have more like of a runway to do this Wisconsin should be a really big one. Washington, uh, they're also giving attention. To those, those are both states with uncommitted options and uh, a lot of attention going towards them right now. So those are both worth keeping track of. But um, like this is the yeah, you're right. This is the kind of result that is usually the result of like decades old political currents and discontent and like deep seated things that like took centuries to develop. It is not like something you see over a conflict that started five months ago and people have been organizing around it for only like three weeks. It took people years, like decades, to organize around Vietnam. Like this is extremely rapid. Yeah. No, absolutely. Even if you, even if you compare it to something like uh, uh, closer to home, like the Iraq War, like people started, people started souring on on uh, Iraq. Like it took it took years for people to sour on Iraq. Obviously, there's other factors here at play. Here, for example, this is still technically perceived by the electorate as a foreign nation that is conducting <laughs> its affairs, so it makes it easier for people to be like, oh, well, what the. We're giving them money to go kill children. I don't like that. And we weren't the ones who were attacked. Overall, I think that uh, the Biden campaign is paying close attention to these numbers. Internally, this is causing chaos. We've seen this yield marginally positive results in terms of communication. And the media is only covering it because it's an issue that they know how to cover. They love the Mm -hmm. drama. So they see like this is causing panic in the Biden camp. So they will cover it in a way that they would never cover like protests on the streets. It's the only thing going on in the Democratic democratic side you can quantify it you can write like an analysis of it like it's it's like it's kind of like a lifeline for people who write about elections and honestly i'm including myself in this like it like this is very very like there's not a ton going on right now the polls have been very stagnant so to a degree i think that like there might be some like kind of uh incentive to talk about this maybe more than it, they might have otherwise but even in that case like these numbers are like very like very stunning the minnesota one specifically the other ones you can kind of give or take but like these are just very bad for biden he nearly got a lower percentage of the vote than trump did who was running in a contested primary i think the calculation that some people are making is that like uncommitted plus dean phillips plus marianne williamson doesn't come near like the the anti-trump voters in the republican party and they should be worried about that yeah, not well, realizing trump isn't that like a lot of people either. are still going to vote for fucking trump um, trump isn't a good candidate either that's the point yeah. like the whole reason that you not Biden was because he, he was supposed to be a really good candidate saying that he's at the same level as Trump 
isn't a defense of him. It means that he's failing at like the one thing he was supposed to do, as we know that he is. Like he was supposed to, this was supposed to be, you're not supposed to be making those comparisons at all. This is supposed to be the advantage of incumbency. You are, he is not an in power president. He doesn't have like, he has the party behind him, but he's not like an incumbent. Like this is, it's different races. It's apples to oranges. The fact that like it even merits a comparison in the first place is a sign of how poorly Biden is doing, like, and how much people are alienated by his like campaign and policies and tactics. Here's the, ladies and gentlemen, the median voter. This is the the Nikki voter that uh, Biden is dropping some of the very important demographics that he needs to win, that he used to win in 2020. Younger voters, Hispanic voters in states like Nevada, Arizona. Like, these are very important constituencies that definitely are already very sour on Biden's administration so far, hate how old he is, and also on top of that now, definitely hate his either right-wing reactionary immigration policies that he's advancing or the relentless bombing campaign that's happening with our tax dollars. Now, Biden has thrown those voters aside to win over this person, Mickey Stout, 80 from Richmond, voted for Trump in 2016 and 2020. I think Trump is so irrational and very, very frightening. I think that if he allowed this January 6th thing to take place he could try to take over the next time if he doesn't win this one i just think he's dishonest and i don't want that but i think biden is too i definitely won't vote for biden i will have to vote for trump yeah this is part of a smaller thing that i've been thinking about lately and it's like not nearly as big of a question as the other like things about biden there's sort of this assumption that like biden himself beyond the age thing is like this great politician and like that if he can just break through the age thing like um like people will naturally like him i'm not really entirely sure of that because even when like he was like totally lucid and like 20 years younger he still really comes across as just like kind of like a smarmy like machine politician like i like people talk a lot of like i've seen a lot of these interviews mention him as just like being disingenuous and like just like i mean and i can't really like well, he was it, it's goof. like a weird kind of angle he was to always go a goof. At. yeah like yeah. there was never a moment like he <laughs> the reason why he had to drop out the first time he ran for president was because of plagiarism. People called yeah. him an idiot like openly in broad daylight. <laughs> like, yeah, he, he's always been kind of a goofy guy. American politics has become increasingly more goofy. So we don't really care about yeah. those sorts of things as much now. And as a matter of fact, that might even show what's yeah. up. He, he looks statesman like like in 2020. He looked like by com in comparison to stuff. There, but like that was just an idea of Joe Biden, the actual guy himself. The more people have seen of him since 2019, generally, the less they like of him. Um, and the problem with age is that it's the one thing time won't change and will mm -hmm. make worse. As time yeah. goes on, he is going to continue to age. So uh, I don't know how they're going to fix that major. Yeah. And for what it's worth, I was just checking like the averages. His approval right now is the lowest it's been his entire presidency. It's minus 18.7. Uh, it has never been this low before. He is like each day he he becomes like less and less politically viable. And uh, it's just they had this whole narrative about how he like was totally in like the, the dumps in the summer of 2022. And then he passed all those bills and he made a comeback. He's below what he was during like the, the dark ages when like inflation was at nine percent. Like he has been ramping up his campaign. He's been public facing. He's been making himself more known. He's been spending a lot of money and raising a lot of money. But the more people see of him, the less they like they like him. And they didn't like him that much already. Um, do you think that in your assessment, do you think the calculation of trying to maintain Nikki Haley w voters or try to make an argument for Nikki Haley voters uh, that will genuinely piss off the the uh, I think it was originally like 17 percent of uh, voters that were like uh, in the demographics that he needs to win a according to the New York Times assessment a couple months back before October 7, like pushing them aside. Do you think this calculation can work in the general? Yeah, well, the thing is that he needs both of them. He needs both the anti-Trump Republicans and the young voters. He can't really pick and choose like his campaign is doing like this sort of thing where they're being very, they're trying to like reach out to the Haley supporters while not even saying uncommitted like in their press releases. Biden barely won in 2020. His winning margin was only a couple 10,000 votes across a couple states like he can't afford any slippage like he can't like he needs to build back his entire coalition which was very broad and rickety and it added up to a majority but he's nowhere near that now and the fact that like these kind of things like the idea of appealing to young voters and appealing to moderate republicans is like kind of like it's, it feels mutually exclusive now it speaks to how much he's backed himself into a corner because that wasn't the case back four years ago when um trump was the dominating issue 
he's just not a candidate who is capable of really like making a clear appeal in this kind of election. I think he's fundamentally very ill suited for it. There are a lot of candidates who would be suited for this very well, especially against Trump. And like in Senate races, I brought this up in the article that I wrote for The Nation that was published yesterday. Democrats are leading in nearly every single competitive Senate seat right now. And that includes states like Ohio and Montana, like very red states. And all of the swing states where Trump has been leading for the past six months The Senate Democrats are ahead by substantial margins. Some people might say that's just name recognition or incumbency, but Arizona is a case there. Another girl boss went down yesterday or today. Uh, Kirsten Sinema dropped out. That's a state where Biden is losing outside the margin of error. error. He's down by five or so points in Arizona. Uh, He doesn't look like he's on track to win it at all. At the same time, Ruben Gallego, a Democrat who is not an incumbent, he's just a congressman who's been around for about 10 years, hasn't run in statewide races before, isn't well known. He is consistently leading against Carrie Lake, who is basically a Trump clone. There is not a conservative bent to this country. People aren't voting Trump or saying they want to vote for Trump because they like his policies or hate the left. They just think that Biden is uniquely ill-suited for the current moment. And I can't stress that enough. If he loses, people are going to say it's because of wokeness or whatever. It's the opposite case. People want wokeness. They don't want Biden. Yeah, no, Biden's, um, if the last five months of this administration didn't go down the way it did, right now, any other candidate that isn't like visibly 800 years old would be crushing, I think. Yeah. I like still even think with even with out. negative real wage growth that people experience throughout the administration, there are a lot of positives that you could be promoting, whether it be a pro labor stint better, the IRA, you know what I mean? Like there are there yeah. are definitely achievements that you can point to that you don't have to present even as like a bipartisan well, for the sake of bipartisanship. It's just, it's just it's just good. Like he accomplished they passed some good laws. It's not like this is better than what Republicans would do. A lot of what they did was outright positive. I don't like I think that their economic policies were good. We do have the best recovery in the world of comparable economies in the world right now. That's not really up for dispute. The question and people don't necessarily hate those laws or whatever. It's not like Obamacare or some huge divisive issue. The question in this election is leadership. People are very, I think people are extremely tired from the culture wars and the constant back and forth, like um, war and fighting. They are willing to accept pretty much any policies that sound good for them, like lower taxes. Sure, that's good. More social spending. Sure. Why not try that? Let's see if it works. But they want to at least feel like there's a direction forward and someone capable at the wheel. I think the Biden people do understand the idea of creating a clear kind of philosophy. I don't hate that idea necessarily, but they should realize that the vessel they're trying to do for it is completely inadequate. Um, There was a chatter in here that was talking about no president ever, no incumbent ever winning re-election, being sub 40% approval rating. Yeah. And and Biden has been there for the past Since five October months. 7, Since October 7th. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the situation looks dire, but it doesn't seem like the Democrat party and the people that have biden's ear are remotely interested in making assessments and changing course i'm not even talking about like literally change swapping out biden which was definitely valid and maybe still could happen due to i I, I think it's still a good idea yeah i I think nature playing out its course could be one reason why they have to swap biden or even uh, i don't know like like a convention this is uh, the jank mentum but uh you know a, a a delegate race a delegate war at convention potentially yeah, that's how they used to do it. They did that for 150 years and people yeah. have worked out fine. Like it's like everybody talks about like it's some imaginable catastrophe. People would be I think people would be fine with that. They'd be like, oh, they listened to us. We didn't like Biden. Now they're getting a new person to see who they pick. Like it's not like people are like married. Like there are some states where that's still how candidates are selected. And it works out. Like in Virginia, the governor there, Glenn Youngkin, wasn't voted for in a primary. He was selected at a convention. People were fine with him and he won. Like it's not like the end of the world to like have that kind of thing going on. Usually like like you could argue that it's worked out better. Like we've had um, uh, um, open primaries to select nominees since 1972. I can't think of like really many good presidents we've had since then. So what are what are some uh, more interesting things that you observed uh, throughout Super Tuesday, uh, both yeah. on the media coverage side or also in the races? Anything yeah, that we're missing? Well, yeah, well, I think that um, generally the interesting thing here is that um, if you kind of squint, you can see that like Uncommitted did the best um, in urban areas. That's um, in like that was the case in Michigan. 
It was the case in Minnesota. It was sort of the case in Massachusetts. Like, I don't think No Preference did terribly well there, but it did do a bit better in Boston. So this is clearly like, if anybody was going to say it was just Arabs or conservatives, that, yeah, it, it was even North Carolina, it did better in like the research triangle. If anybody was going to say this was just conservatives or Arabs or whatever, this is like a thing that happens to all incumbents and it doesn't mean anybody's mad at Biden. That is clearly not true at this point. Um, I don't think that like you can make a case for that at all. It was... Um, the Republican maps were interesting because of how it reminded me a lot of the if you remember the Liz Cheney um, race when she lost by like 50 points. Uh, the only areas she won were the Democratic counties in Wyoming. And that's basically what's been happening in like all of the contests she's won. She's only won Democratic precincts in counties. She did very. She It's interesting because she does terribly almost everywhere. But then there are some areas he does. She does extremely well. Like uh, she did very well in northern Virginia, like um, where all the CIA workers are. Yeah. So um, I, yeah, they fell off. They they are they don't they are, they don't do it like they don't make them like they used to. Yeah. No. Absolutely. <sighs> what else? There's some other there's some other stuff I wanted to talk about, but um, I, I do think, like I said, I do think that the, like the uncommitted vote is definitely something that they're paying attention to, uh, whether yeah. they admit it or not, whether the media covers it or not, because ultimately uh, they you know throwing out Kamala bangers yeah. left and right, Kamala Harris in front of Edmund Pettus Bridge, like openly stating like she wants a ceasefire, even though even though it's the same her, policy. But like it tricked a lot of people. Like a lot of people like looked at that. They're like, "Oh wow!" Like I don't blame anybody for that. It took a little while to realize that. Like, oh, she's not really changing anything in policy. But that is a dramatic kind of shift. Supposedly, yeah. um, she um like laid into Benny Gantz when he visited Washington. She, her team, and this is I'm planning her team writing is an to NBC, yeah. being like she actually had way stronger words. Did you see that article? Yeah, yeah, I, the I see the articles all about. Like her team is leaking constantly and that's the one thing that actually makes me think she might do better than biden because she actually gets the election she pulls worse than him but if you read all the stuff that her people have been leaking they're leaking like exxon valdez recently they're putting out stuff that constantly is trying to frame her in a way that she understands the election better than biden they like yeah. released a thing about how she met with all these democratic governors and they all said like this campaign sucks and she was like, I know, like, I'm going to try to help you with that. Like she the, um, this is the, like, this is the Kamala yeah. Harris of the media presented as a uh, more progressive in her voting track record than Bernie Sanders. This, that's we're getting yeah. that Kamala back. We're talking yeah, 2018 Kamala Harris, baby. Yeah. Medicare for all Kamala. She's supporting Medicare for all again. She's supporting reparations. Like yeah. we won. She's a secret Marxist sleeper agent from her dad. Yeah. Her dad, Donald Sterling Harris. Yeah. <laughs> His name well, is Donald I mean, Sterling. His middle name is Sterling. Yeah. Oh, that rocks. I don't know. I mean, I. I don't know what it would look like if Kamala Harris was uh, was leading the charge here. Yeah, she's going to save us. She's going to save in trust, inshallah. But I, I don't know. Maybe maybe if uh, we got more Kamala, maybe she if she got off the downers and were put on uppers, mm -hmm. like yeah, if they gave her some pills. of Joe Brandon's uh, stock, she could yeah. be a very different Kamala Harris. Um, yeah, the idea of her locking in and suddenly being like really compelling and like smart and well-spoken is so funny to me because she's been like so terrible for like six years. No, I mean, she, well, it was obvious from the jump that like to be on the, the sh duties, like she was doing side quests and like yeah. the Caribbean they, islands. They, gave her, they told her to solve immigration and pass voting rights bills. It's like they were setting her up to fail. Yeah, they, I mean, even with uh, Pete Buttigieg, like it tracks with Biden being like an incredibly petty person. He is. Who, oh my God. That is the, I think that's the core of understanding this race. Like our kind of assumption is that like, oh, he's 80 years old. He's totally out of it. Like everybody else is running the administration. No, Biden is like the most spiteful person alive. He's yeah. motivated this run entirely by bitterness. If you read any of like the tell all like kind of big pieces about him, he comes across as like, like the biggest baby on the planet. Yeah. Like he's like, oh, you said we would lose before. You said we would lose in 2022. Uh, I don't want to listen to you. You're wrong. Ha ha. I was right. It's just, it's like what an actual child would say. It's, yeah. uh, it's hard to believe that he's like ever got elected to the, to the presidency. And I think, like, if you read, yeah. I think he hates like Hillary Clinton. And I suspect he doesn't even like Obama as much for tell, urging no. him not to run in 2016 when he could have uh, objectively defeated Donald Oh, yeah. He would have killed it. He would have like won by like 20 points. Yeah. Uh, with the Hillary thing is kind of funny because in like 2020, like right after Me Too, they were trying to figure out what to do with the bill during the convention. And all of the younger staffers were like, oh, we can't let him speak. We can't like give him a spot or anything. He's problematic. And Biden like agreed with them, but it wasn't because he thought Bill was problematic, but because he was pissed at Hillary for like running in 2016. I think he's just genuinely total... super petty, super petty and super both super petty and, and, and super spite driven. Like it's what's keeping him yeah. alive. He's, he's, like, he's Nixonian. People don't realize like, it, but he's, he's the most Nixonian president. We've yeah, had he, this is this is the position that he wanted his whole 
life uh, that he ran for multiple times unsuccessfully. Finally, he got it. His brain is not working in the way that it, it used to, even when it did. So now I think he's just like angrily holding on to this position yeah. and being as resentful as possible. It still doesn't make any sense to me why he is so unimaginably pro-Israel. Oh, I've tried to get into the lore about that. It's like, it's the most insane sh he like talks about how people who were born in like the 1800s like convinced him to be pro-Israel. Like he's like, I talked with Golda Meir and Scoop Jackson, and they're the ones who like made me woke on Israel. Like it's just another one of his like just spiteful tendencies. It's just something that he like believes in and he's going to stick with. And it's it, when it works, when Biden actually has a good opinion on something, it can be really cool. Like he left Afghanistan like the way he did, like entirely out of spite because yeah. he opposed the troop surge back in like 2010 and everybody else made fun of him. All the generals called him an idiot to reporters and Obama didn't listen to him. So he was bitter about that part. Like supposedly the reason why he kept all those documents in his garage was he because he wanted to prove that he was right about the troop surge in 2010. Like he's just like this very like he's a complete diva. He's like an 81 year old irish catholic like it's not looking great uh the one guy who can lose to the other guy who's the only guy who can lose it's just a mid-off um, yeah I don't know how to force versus a movable object and um I, I think it's hurting media ratings too so it, like if the media is uh, self-interested yeah. in if the media is self-interested and and like wants to get better ratings i think like uh hoping that like trump wins the presidency is not the the best way to do this no people would just get so depressed I don't really think that'd be helpful for like if you're like a left of center media person. I'm not like looking forward to that prospect. Like I don't think people will be very interested in reading about politics. But like it's not like when he won the first time, where it was this huge shock. It's like we kind of know who this guy is now. Like it's not there's not much really interesting, and it's just like depressing. Like oh he just got away with it. Like that's how the story ends because this one old guy didn't want to like he had a massive ego. I guess the, the moral of the story is you don't run an 81 year old for president. Very like interesting. We learned a lot. Very like <laughs> valuable lesson. Um, I feel like we covered all the bases. Are you familiar with the one guy Mando in Texas? Yes. Coolest guy ever. Insane. Like yeah. just the most insane candidate I've seen. I, I, cause I was looking at it cause I was, you know, I'm a part of the jank mentum train, obviously as his like press secretary, <laughs> even though I keep urging people to vote uncommitted instead of him, which is fun, kind of, Oh, he got like 1% of the vote in Vermont. Yeah, I think what? he did. He got 700 votes in Vermont. He got votes in Oklahoma. I well, think yeah. I think he did I think um he did well in like the really working class racist areas of Oklahoma. Who Mando or Jank? Yeah, no, Sank. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I okay. think he did well in like Cole County. Like um, literally there's see, a county there, there. there these County. he's the uniter of the white working class. He um, is, yeah. He is. And clearly <laughs> racist people are like I can't say his name, but I like it. I like what he's yeah. saying. <laughs> well, Oklahoma is like weirdly woke in the Democratic primary actually. Yeah. Remember, this is a, that's a Bernie Yeah, it was a big Bernie state. Oklahoma's always been like that. Very odd. Anyway, yeah, Mando, I wanted to briefly touch on Armando Perez Serrato uh, ran on the Democratic Party ticket in the primaries in Texas. The only reason why I know who he is is because he apparently was doing better than Jank. And I was like, who the f is this guy? Right? Yeah, he did well on the border. Wait, did he delete all of his? Oh, he. OK. No, yeah, it's his, over. He was running. And originally I thought he's running on a campaign promise of like executing Donald Trump by charging him for, with treason, which I yeah. thought was like kind of cool. And then very quickly, I found out that like he is the most virulent, openly anti-Semitic person that I've seen. Yeah, running. he got he got like 30 percent of the vote in some counties on the border. Yeah, he is. Uh, he's he's a straight up groiper. Mm -hmm. uh, Talking about how he like, uh, wait, where is it? Oh, here, here's his takes on genocide. Joe Biden is uber old. 82 has Alzheimer's will lose to Trump. He prices high on everything and continue his genocide in Palestine. A vote for Biden is like a vote for Hillary Clinton. Let's not make that mistake again. Okay. Seems normal. Yeah. Go on. And <laughs> I saw this, this guy was born in Turkey. The United States constitution only allows natural born American citizens to be president. So he has no chance A vote for Jake is like a vote for the Taliban slash ISIS. No, he doesn't know. He, does, he has no idea. He doesn't know Turkey's secular. Then this part is where it gets, starts to get a little bit more spicy. She dropped out of the presidential race a month ago. Now she says she's back to her publicity stunt to sell more books. Okay, valid. Fine. She is another mm -hmm. Jew that wants to control you. No. What no. the f
And then you look at like all of the people that he has uh, tabs for here, like Adam Schiff. Adam uh-huh. Schiff is Jewish and responsible <laughs> for genocide in Gaza. You're no. Like Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi is responsible for genocide in Gaza. Chuck Schumer is Jewish and responsible no. for genocide in Gaza. My problematic fave. Bernie Sanders is Jewish and responsible for genocide in Gaza. <laughs> <laughs> that's his those are his policies he's he's there's a point where he calls uh someone adolf hitler and it mm-hmm. literally it in it, it it frustrated me uh, like it seems like he's Why pro hitler dingle, she's like a random ass member of the house of representatives she doesn't like do anything yeah debbie dingle why are you angry at debbie dingle she's the one like <laughs> ringing the alarm bells for the for the Brandon campaign yeah. about changing course in Michigan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't really He's understand why he has smoke for Debbie Dingle. I, I like that he put Hillary Clinton on there as well, which is like, what? She she's not she's running. Like, she's, do, she's like walking around in the woods, man. <laughs> yeah, anyways, oh. I was looking at the Oklahoma results and Sank's best county was Cole County. Yeah, Oklahoma, <laughs> very woke. Uh, Oklahoma Democratic primary, pretty woke. Look at yeah, the black community section. Woke. Oh, God, I don't even want to know if I... Wait, he has an affirmative action plan? Wait, what? Yo, like, but it's for gay people. This is this is the median voter, dog. This is, yeah, this this is guy, he's gonna decide the election. This is the most insane candidate I've ever encountered that has like actually gotten a decent percentage of votes. He has a Spanish website. Bill Nelson didn't. He was a senator. He wants to increase social security by fifty percent. He wants to create a national mon- monument. He wants to build renewable hydrogen plants. A- image pacho via mexican revolution thank you mando <laughs> yeah mando he's he, he's he's just wilding out <laughs> yeah mando for everyone except no jews <laughs> he seems like Conquer he seems Trump, like, and he posted a picture of oh, the mandalorian that's clever click the black community tab i'm scared mando loves black people he will yeah <laughs> will execute the mass shooter just one of them he will remove all migrants from black communities, provide a hundred billion in black community based reparations. Oh my god, he's woke. Let's go. He's, he's pro reparations. Let's go. But also wants to expel all migrants from black communities. This is a type of ideology nobody's seen since like 1890. Dude, it's this is awesome because he's like he's actually the future of the Democratic Party. <laughs> <laughs> the, Democratic party is gonna, the Democratic Party is going to run on this uh, next election cycle after they hear it from like Marjorie Taylor Greene like they did with the border policy bill that yeah. they tried to present. Marjorie Taylor Greene, we were all laughing. Why do we care about Ukraine's borders when we don't care about our borders? And everyone was laughing at that and we're like, oh yeah, shut up, dude. You're so stupid. And now like <laughs> six, seven, eight months later, Brandon is saying the exact same thing in a border town in Texas. Who voted for this guy are going to vote for Trump in November? Every single one of them. Yeah. Uh, Hitler quoting candidate won in North Carolina Republican gubernatorial primary, Mark Robinson. Oh, yeah, that guy's and also And also Brandon Herrera. I forgot to mention. That's one of ours. A YouTuber. Who's that? Oh. Brandon Herrera is a Brandon Herrera is a is a gun YouTuber, a gun tuber. Moderate Republican Tony Gonzalez fails to clinch GOP nomination and is forced into a runoff against gun tuber Brandon Herrera. Did we just win? No, he's a <laughs> psycho. He's an absolute psychopath. No, he, he's one of our guys. Yeah, I well, I mean, yeah, I ride for all the YouTubers. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what their <laughs> politics are. If they're if they're an influencer, I'm I'm with you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He is uh most most famous for making a, a he loves the AK platform. So at least that's like <laughs> you know a, a good take. But uh, he made a uh, he made a 50 cal AK. Was it good? I don't know. I've never watched it. I just, I've just heard the legends. Yeah. He's creating Fallout New Vegas in real life. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, also is that like Texas is insane. I guess I forget. Oh yeah. Review. There are a bunch of like local <laughs> feuds there going on. Like they're insane, like psychotic attorney general. Yes. Who was nearly impeached. Exactly what I want to talk about. So Kim Paxton, very controversial, very corrupt. There was a whole impeachment process that occurred in Texas. For those of you who don't remember, Kim Paxton, super pro Trump attorney general. And literally like there is this incredibly vindictive, like anyone who came after Paxton got basically shot shanked uh, yeah as far as i understand in the state of texas yeah it, it's so cool because it wasn't even like an ideological thing it was just him being like corrupt like it wasn't like he was too yeah. conservative and they kicked him out he was just yeah. like he just like accepted bribes yeah and the republicans that actually voted to impeach him got 
cooked by people who are pro Paxton and pro Trump. Yeah, and voters. He wasn't even like any more pro Trump than any of the other guys. He was just a criminal. They just assumed like, oh, he just did. They said he did crime, so he must be like one of us. Yeah, that's what that's what the that's what the Texas Republican Party is, is looking at right now. I think the Democrats probably look at things like that and and salivate at the prospect of like, oh. Thank God these like insanely reactionary Republicans are are actually cooking each other so that we can make an argument even more in the general to say, look, see, these are the Trump Republicans. They're crazy. Vote for us instead. But once yeah. again, I think this like look that does work. It worked in 2022. They won by landslide margins in tons of swing states like that is it does work. People don't like these guys like it's not like it's some sort of complicated thing. Like, people are sick of them. They think that they're corrupt. They think that they're extreme. They think that they can't govern. But when you're putting up a guy they think is literally too old to function as president, yes. it makes it more complicated than it otherwise should be. No, absolutely. That's what I was going to say, is that, like, relying on the Republican Party's ineptitude or increasingly reactionary politics is going against what voting is supposed to be for. At this stage, we've completely lost sight of like voting for someone or voting for something. And At now the national we are just, level for sure. Yeah, everyone everyone just votes defensively. It's just defensive voting all the way down. Um, Republicans also engage in their version of defensive voting as well, where they present the Re Democratic Party as like people who will come in and like bring uh, Salvadoran immigrants to like rape your daughters is what they're saying like openly. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you can only put a stop to this if you vote for us but there's still certain things that the republican party owns right racism second amendment like gun rights you can have all the coolest guns you can have an entire arsenal we will never take that away from you types of like wedge issues that create single issue voters and cause them to vote for something democratic party is like losing sight yeah. of that entirely and simply 100%. saying look how bad the republicans are vote for us instead yeah and it's getting into their messaging too and this is a thing that like i think was always very weird about like the bidenomics messaging because they were messaging the economy like they were a Republican administration, like the prior, like what they campaigned on and their priorities were just to um, um, make the GDP higher. That's not why people vote for Democrats. People don't vote for Democrats because they want to like maximize growth. They vote for Democrats because they support social programs that they like. They vote for them because like they're going to like Social Security and Medicaid. It's not necessarily that they think that they'll like create a 90 style economy again. They were so proud of themselves for doing that under Clinton. That, like they've been obsessed with that being their appeal. But that's a secondary thing. People would be happy if you could do that, but it's not like your main argument. So when you're coming into an election where you did pass a lot of, because of the nature of how Senate procedure works, you were able to pass a lot of big money spending programs that juiced the economy and made things generally like better than other countries. Still not actually good. There was negative wage growth that should have not been forgotten, but like that's the second thing. When you're running basically like how George W. Bush or Trump would run the economy, when you're when you have a base that votes for you because they want you to expand welfare, you're not going to be speaking to your own constituents. You're speaking to a part like the the voters in another party that don't like you for a thousand other reasons. Like even like that would be the case if it even was compelling, which it isn't. Well, it's a good thing so that they're trying to get people to vote for them on an another issue that they always lose on immigration. Instead of counter messaging yeah. around immigration and going along with the arguably more successful presentation saying like America is a nation of immigrants. That killed. That worked. Yeah, that worked. It always worked. That's what Trump, like people hated Trump did. They hated the wall. Like that we are a unique, we're not like Europe. We have a different understanding of these kinds of things and going down like, and that was the one thing I think the democratic party actually did right compared to other um, le um, left of center parties in Europe where they conceived it on the issue like 20 years ago. Uh, political scientists have studied this. They found that when like, it is not a new thing to try to siphon votes away from a dangerous far right anti-democratic yeah. party who's running an immigration by taking their positions in immigration. European parties have done that since the 90s and the early 2000s. And it, but what never, happens but it always places, failed. Yeah. It always failed. Yeah. It is, it it, it is demonstrably the failed. Yeah. Because it all it, we talked about this last time you were on, but all it does is basically normalize the position that immigrants are a problem, actually. And you're, ba you're, you're giving that entire issue, you're delivering it gift wrap to the 
fascist party that is always going to be the the real owners of that issue. The yeah, and it raises here is patriotism and like military service, like the John Kerry dynamic all over again. I know yeah, it's one of your it faves, but the issue it, it makes the issue environment better for Republicans. It's baffling. Like if you look at the two things, the two big things the Biden campaign has done over the past year, and it's been about a year since they launched the campaign. It was to launch, make a major campaign on the economy and make a major campaign on immigration. It's the exact opposite of how you should actually be utilizing the power of the presidency, which is it. you can't really convince people in the way politics works now. You can't really like change their minds to agree with you and become liberals. What you can do is that you can manipulate the media environment so people are thinking more about the issues that they side with you on. That would involve like campaigning more, like making abortion a larger issue in people's minds. It would involve making like Social Security or Medicare a larger question. The other, yeah. like the question of Trump's criminality, you could even probably be doing more on that. Just making that in the news more, using the bully pulpit to make that a more salient thing. But when you're asking people to judge you on the immigration and the economy, your two worst issues by far, you're asking to lose. Yeah, 100%. So, so, so stupid. When the, the campaign should be doing things like uh, that happened on accident either, or that like it was a Trump miscalculation when Trump came out. It was leaked to the press, I guess, that Trump's uh, new abortion bill at the federal level was going to be like either presented as like protecting abortion or further restricting it at the feather federal level a couple like a yeah. month ago, if you remember. It was that the was 16 huge. Week ban. Yeah. Yeah. Which the is a ban. ban is huge. It's a it's that is basically a gift wrapped basket full of goodies for the for the uh, for the Democratic Party. Yeah. And the biggest issue for abortion in 2022 was that some states that people didn't see it as an issue because, oh, it's been delegated to the states. I live in a liberal state like California or New York, so it's not my problem. I got my bag. This is doing this for you. You're saying, no, even if you live in a state like New York or California, Trump is coming after you with this. He's trying to change your lives. He's trying to dictate how things are done for you. And while this wouldn't like get rid of any abortion bans, it would get rid of abortion protection laws. It nationalized an issue that previously their best strategy could have been to localize it. Yeah. I mean, I don't think they had any good strategies on this at all, but this is the worst way they could have done it. Yeah, that along and with the IVF thing was like two major gifts to the Democratic Party. And I think that like their hyper focus on on right wing, like capitulating to right wing framing on immigration, unironically just neutralized that talking point in the media immediately because everyone's like talking about the dueling border policy. bills or whatever. But not bills, yeah. but like uh, dueling border proposals. They act like they don't believe in their own policies. They like. They act like they don't think that they're actually right about the things that they support. Get Biden out there and like they assume they they treat Biden like the more people see of him, the more they'll hate him. They treat their own policies on the border like they can't even argue for them. They can't argue for the economy on the the basis of what they campaigned on. They have to pretend that they're better at what Trump was trying to do than Trump. It's like this, like they like there's this idea that like moderates like are always more like adept and smarter at politics. But when you get to the point where like you're so lost in the sauce of appealing to people that you just start arguing against yourself, hurt you more than just sticking to your beliefs and looking like a like an honest person. Ed and Germentum. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on. Good to be on. I need to get to writing my Camelot article now, but all right. Yeah. Kamala 2024, we're K yes. Harvers. Yeah, the pivot, coconut tree, coconut tree gang, rise yeah, up. Exactly. The K Harvers need to take these old, antiquated, racist white men out of positions of power. And the exactly. only one who can do it is the charismatic figure, Kamala Harris. Black Girl Magic 2024. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. That was Edinger Mentum, like the mods have posted. Twitter.com slash Edinger Mentum. News for his Substack.